Hi, this is Father Bill W. here in Austin, Texas, and I want to welcome you to the podcast. I'm an Episcopal priest in long-term recovery. Uh, if I make it another few months, uh, I'll, I'll be at 48 years. So I've been at this thing for a fairly long period of time. Uh, and, and of course, AA changed my life. But uh, at about 20 years sober, I was looking for something deeper. I'd kind of hit a wall. And, and I find that that's not uncommon, that uh, even people who are working the program real seriously and uh, doing a good job of it, uh, I, th I think I, I, I was to you know, some extent anyway. Um, but I knew that I needed something different. I needed to go deeper. And it was then that I got introduced uh, by a man by the name of Earl Husband to uh, the Oxford group and uh, the emergence of the AA program out of that Oxford group. And while I had known a little bit about it, uh, after my meeting with Earl, I spent about three hours with him one night in his home. Uh, after that, uh, I, I set out to learn as much as I could about, about the group uh, and how AA emerged out of it. And one of the things that uh, really jumped out at me uh, not long into the, into the study of this stuff was that there was a thing called two-way prayer that they used to do, and it really formed the heart and soul of the transformation process. So I began practicing that, and that is really the thing that changed my life. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry that it got left behind. Uh, um, it's kind of there in the big book, but it's, uh, it's almost like it's in code. So uh, my, my purpose in life has really been to bring this back into the program, um, introduce people to it, and see if it can't uh, have an effect on them in the way that it did on, on me. And, and for a good number of people, that's what I'm seeing happening. And so we, we've been doing some, uh, well, we, we did the website first. Uh, it's called Two-Way Prayer, and I invite you to go visit that. It teaches you, <clears throat> excuse me, how to do the process. And uh, we also uh, have done a number of Zoom workshops, got some more coming up uh, in the next few months. Um, uh, if you would write me at twowayprayer at gmail.com, I'll be happy to send you a flyer uh, with the dates and the times. So... Um, these podcasts are, are an attempt to uh, help people understand some of the history and, and in particular, uh, some of the Oxford group uh, principles and practices that uh, might be helpful to you in, uh, in work in your own program today. Some things were left behind, and, and I think they should have been, uh, but others, others were left behind, and, and I think that was unfortunate. So two-way prayer for me is, is the biggest one. So in this, uh, this series, we're, we're doing it on the life of Bill Wilson, not so much from an historical perspective of uh, giving you all the facts and the dates and, and that kind of thing, but more in, in terms of looking at what was going on inside of him. And, and even more important than that <clears throat> are some of the things that were going on inside of him also going on inside of us, or, or if not, uh, could they be? So that, that's kind of the way I've been approaching it. We uh, left Bill uh, last time at Towns Hospital. He had uh, just undergone his white light experience, his mountaintop experience, said he felt the presence of God uh, in the room when he called out in great despair. And, uh, and, and he was changed as a result of that. In the last episode, I tried to make the point that there were, <clears throat> excuse me, there were perhaps two uh, spiritual experiences that, that Bill had in that hospital room. The first one gets all the attention, but I think the second one was uh, maybe uh, as important, if not even more important. And this one came in terms of a vision that uh, that he he knew something very pr profound had happened to him, that something had shifted at a deep unconscious level. And, uh, and he then had a vision of uh, taking whatever it was that happened to him, if, if he could kind of codify it, understand it, uh, get it down on paper in some way, 
and then carry that out to other alcoholics. That became the vision that really transformed him and that I think needs to be a part of each one of our programs, uh, that we don't just get sober for ourselves. There's a, there's a, a, a need to take this out to others who are, are still trapped. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, this is what uh, Bill wrote when he was reflecting on his own experience and looking forward to the vision of changing alcoholics uh, all around the world. He said, the moment of admission of hopelessness, if it ran deep enough, any alcoholic could begin to receive faith and release. And one alcoholic turning the message to another could ready the sufferer for his gift as nobody else could. At this point, my excitement became boundless. A chain reaction could be set in motion, forming an ever-growing fellowship of alcoholics whose mission it would be to visit the caves of still other sufferers and set them free. As each dedicated himself to carrying the message to still another and those released to still others, such society could pyramid to tremendous proportions why it could reach every single alcoholic in the world capable of being honest enough to admit his own defeat. There must be millions of them, the alcoholics who still didn't know. So there's, there's Bill's vision and, uh, and it drove him uh, really for the rest of his life. Uh, How, how do you help alcoholics experience what he experienced? Because he knew that it was through that experience, both both of Ebby carrying the message to him, uh, and that was critical, and and then the letting go, the call, the release. So Bill leaves the hospital now, and he sets out to, to find these alcoholics. And he, he was gonna do it, of course, through the Oxford group, because that's how it came to him. It came to him uh, in the Oxford group through his friend Ebby, Ebby had been staying at a mission in downtown New York, sober 60 days only when he made the call on Bill and, uh, and, and successfully uh, carried the message. So Bill joins with Ebby uh, at, the, at, at the Oxford Group headquarters. Uh, they were at Calvary Church in, in the United States. The Oxford Group was led by a fellow by the name of Sam Shoemaker. He was an Episcopal priest also. And, uh, and he, a very dynamic uh, speaker, writer. Uh, and after Frank Bookman, he was, he was really like second in command uh, of the whole Oxford group uh, movement. And so let's, uh, let's pause for just a minute or two and, and give you a quick overview. I've got some uh, podcasts that, that speak about the Oxford group and what their beliefs are and what some of their history was. But if you're new to this, uh, we'll just run you through it real quickly. It was started by a man by the name of Frank Bookman. He was a Lutheran minister. And just like Bill, he underwent a spiritual experience. And it came about uh, as the result of resentment. He was running a group home for young men in the Philadelphia area. And the board of directors tells him he's got to cut back on his food bill. And he's spending too much feeding these guys. And, and he gets angrier than hell, quits his job, goes over to England where he was scheduled to go um, on a, to a conference. And a woman at that point, uh, Jesse Penn Lewis was her name. And, and she, he's in a little church, a little chapel. And she gives a sermon. And he said... She didn't say anything that I had not heard before, but for some reason, it got through to me that day like nothing else could. And her sermon was on the cross. Seems like every time she gave a sermon, it it, it in one way or another went back to being crucified, suffering, and, and God working through the suffering. And, 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 um, Bookman came out of that changed. He, he and he used the he used to talk about the I, uh, which is the ego, the I being crossed out. 
by the cross. Uh, and that became just, just like for Bill. When Bill was changed, he knew he had to carry that change to others. And that just seems to be the nature of a tr genuinely transformational experience, that, that it cannot just stay with the individual who experiences it. There's a natural movement outward. Uh, that's why I think step, step you know, 11 leads inextricably to step 12. If you've had a spiritual uh, experience, you know, you got to then carry that. If you're in, in, in connection with God and God's speaking to you in 11, then naturally it's going to flow into 12 because it's just the nature of spiritual experiences. So th that's what Bookman did. He, he, began, he began changing other people. Uh, and, and, and he would take things that helped in the change, the transformation process, and use them. And out of that, he developed uh, a very loose kind of program. Uh, and, and it involved sharing at a very deep level your faults, uh, making amends to people for harms done, uh, Wilson said he got steps, what became steps, 2 through 11, directly from uh, the Oxford group. So uh, they're, they're very, very much a part of our history. And, uh, and, and the thing that Bookman was convinced of, and to me this has been important, was that, um, you know, this, he was developing this in, in the period between World War I and World War II. And his conviction was, if there's not a new kind of Christianity, a really transformational kind of Christianity, uh, the world is going to hell. And see, at that time, there was communism is the answer. Yeah, it was because that's what's growing up in Russia and in other parts of the world, in China. Uh, Nazism in, in Germany. Uh, fascism in Italy and in Spain and other countries. People were looking for, they, 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 they knew the world had to change, but how do you change it? And, and this is where, where Bookman's program was, was so vital. He said, he said you know, uh, it's got to be, it's got to be through uh, faith in God and then living, living a God-guided life because that was what had happened to him. So um, he sets out to uh, change the world. And, and, and in his biographies, some of the authors say, uh, and I think this is important, that he's not a reformer. He, he's not out to reform Christianity. He's out to revolutionize it. And he, that he thought of himself as a revolutionary. And I think, he, he would make the case, and, and, and some theologians would make the case, that Jesus was not a reformer. It's not that we're going to tweak around the edges a little bit and clean this up and change that. No, it was a radical, radical transformation. And that, I think, is what lays at the heart of what became the AA program. <coughs> radical transformation. Radical change. Not, ju not, not just tidying up uh, a, a little bit. So, so, so there's, there's Wilson. He's getting into this. He's, he's not that comfortable with organized religion. Ne never, never really was. Uh, but he's, he's, he is deep into uh, the Oxford group. Okay? Uh, and and, and here's, here's a quote from his uh, autobiography. He says, our enthusiasm, and he's talking about himself and Lois, uh, this is the first six months, our enthusiasm knew no bounds. Heaven was our destination, and the world our oyster. We plunged headlong into the feverish activity uh, about us. The life-giving water was wonderful, and we splashed joyously for some time. Uh, there is something about... Uh, when you are changed, when you are transformed, there's a joy, there's a freedom, there's a release, and, and you just want to spread that word, okay? So there's Bill. He's doing it, doing it in New York. And <laughs> interestingly, 
not having great success. Uh, he later said he worked with about uh, 50 alcoholics and not a one of them got sober. Uh, it, it looked like they were going to, um, but they didn't. But he stayed sober. And this was the thing that Lois pointed out to him when he was getting uh, despondent. He said, look, Bill, she said, look, Bill, you've stayed sober through this process. And that's, that's the important thing. Don't give up. Don't give up on it. So there, there's Bill doing his thing. Uh, he, and now he's going to go out, of course, as, as, as you all know, to Akron, Ohio. And there he's going to meet Dr. Bob. So what I want to do right now is, is, is change the scene for a little bit, take, take the spotlight off of Bill. And let's look at, uh, at what's happening out in Akron, Ohio. Because I think if you, if you really learn the history uh, of AA, I don't think you can come away from that study without seeing the hand of God at work. Uh, I guess I guess you can say it's coincidence, uh, but other people say coincidence is, is God acting in disguise, undercover, and and I think that's certainly what I drew from this. So this is part of a history that you, you may not be too familiar with. So I want to go back uh, to a, a guy by the name of. Uh, Bud Firestone. And Bud Firestone is in Akron, Ohio. He is heir, <coughs> excuse me, he's heir to the Firestone fortune. Old man Firestone uh, is, is trying every way he knows to get him sober, and it's not working. Uh, finally, a fellow by the name of uh, Jim Newton comes to town. He's in the employ of Firestone. And uh, he says, you know, uh, maybe there's something we can do for Bud. And through a series of uh, encounters, he, he gets Bud uh, attending a conference with Sam Shoemaker, uh, the, the same fella who is later working with Bill Wilson in New York. Just amazing. But he he gets Bud into an encounter with Sam, and they travel on a train uh, together, coming from Denver. Uh, and, and Sam has an honest talk, as the Oxford Group people were prone to do, and shares his stuff with Bud. And Bud shares then his stuff uh, with with Sam that that he hasn't been able to get sober. And so they do what people did in the Oxford group. Are you, willing, are you willing to ask God for help? Are you willing to invite God into your life? And, and they get down on, on their knees in, in the compartment on the train, and Bud does exactly that. And that's, that's kind of what became our third step. Uh, and they always did the third step with another individual, another individual who had surrendered his or her life to God. They got with this this new prospect, let's call them, and uh, and 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 got them into this surrender, surrender of life and will. So Bud Bud does that, and and what do you know? Bud gets sober. Well, the old man is just delighted, couldn't be happier, and he organizes um, uh, kind of a crusade for the people of Akron. Akron was a rubber town where they built the tires, and, and he knew that there were lots of problems going on in that town. Lots of people had problems. <laughs> people have them everywhere, you know, and, uh, and they needed changing. So a team of 30-plus uh, members of the Oxford Group, including Frank Bookman, come to Akron, Ohio. This is, this is almost two years before Wilson arrives. So they come to Akron. The Protestant churches open their pulpits to these people. They meet in large groups at, guess where? The Mayflower Hotel, you know, uh, where Wilson is going to be looking at the church directory. They're, they're having their meeting there. And, 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 and <clears throat> some people are getting really excited the people who are ready for change. And a couple of those people 
where a woman by the name of Henrietta Cyberling, and she becomes the leader of the Oxford group after, after they leave town. Uh, and she starts running meetings uh, to invite people and they come and they, they would share their two-way prayers with one another, share their writings, share what God is, how God is guiding them in their lives. And the other one uh, is uh, Dr. Bob's wife, Ann Smith. She's one of the early members of Henrietta's group. And, and the, the group is plugging along. Uh, Ann recruits Bob and gets him to come to the group. And while he's attending, he's not doing real well. He's still drinking. And, and more importantly, he's being dishonest with the group. He's not telling them what his problem is. So um, Wilson uh, shows up and, uh, and he's looking for an alcoholic to work with. Well, here, here's a real kicker. Uh, just a few weeks before Wilson comes to town, uh, Anne and Henrietta have a discussion. How's, how's Bob doing? <laughs> not, not so good. Not so good. Um, Henrietta has an idea. And she says, well, here's what I want to do. Let, when we call the group for a special meeting tonight, can, can Bob come? Yeah, he can come. We'll, we'll get him sober enough for that. She talked to all the members of the group, and what she said to them is, tonight, instead of the usual thing, I want each person to share something deep, something that they have perhaps held back from the group and, and have not confessed. Uh, they were big on the letter of James, confess your sins one to another. Um, and that's what happens this, this one night. Uh, they go around the group. And as they, as they go, each person shares something painful, deep. Uh, and when it comes Bob's turn, it has an effect on him. And he says, well, I haven't told you guys this, but secretly, <clears throat> I'm a drinker. I have a problem. Everybody in the group knew that he had a problem, uh, but he thought it was a secret. So they say, oh, Bob, we, we didn't know. <laughs> and uh, would you like us to pray for you? And Bob gets on his knees and the group get on their knees around him, hands on his shoulder. And, and he asks God for help. And it's a few weeks later that Wilson comes to town and uh, is in the, the Mayflower Hotel and, and wants a drink. And remembers that the thing that is keeping him sober is working with other alcoholics. So he goes to the church directory instead of to the bar and he gets in touch with Henrietta Cyberling uh, through uh, another Episcopal priest, uh, Reverend Tonks. Will Wilson said he was always attracted to weird names, funny names. And so his name uh, stood out for him. And he called him and Tonks was a member of the Oxford group, uh, but but he, he knew Henrietta was more active than he, I guess. And he, and he put him in touch. You gotta, he says, I'm a rum hound from New York. And uh, I have an alcoholic. I need an alcoholic to work with. Do you know somebody? And that is what, uh, what led to the meeting that, uh, that we're all familiar with, where, where Bill and Bob come together. Uh, Bob is uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of pushed into this thing by his wife. He's, he's, I'll do 15 minutes with this guy, but that's it. You know, uh, kicking and screaming. He, he goes to the meeting at Henrietta's home and stays there for several hours. Several hours. Why? Because he was hearing what he had been longing to hear. Uh, and just like with Bookman, it wasn't that Bill Wilson knew uh, so much about alcoholism. Uh, it, was, it was that he was seeing in front of him, just, just like Wilson had seen it with Ebby, he was seeing someone who knew it from the inside. And, and that is really what made all of the difference. So 
Um, I'm interested in 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 what what are some takeaways that we might have from from these stories. Uh, the stories aren't so important as 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 the changes that that happened as a result of them. For, for example, I mean the the uh, the date of Dr. Bob's last drink we we, we celebrated on June 10th, and the history is probably showing us that. Uh, it was it was at least a week after that because that's when the conference was that he attended. So so the dates were wrong. How many people did he call? Did Wilson call from the hotel? Was it really his last nickel or dime that he's putting into the telephone? <laughs> These stories have a way of uh, building up and getting exaggerated. Uh, don't don't let that concern you. Go for the essence of what is behind the story. What's inside of the story. What are, what are the transforming things that are being conveyed to us through the stories? Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick uh, maybe three or four here. Um, and, and the first one I, I would focus on is this, that um, if, if you've surrendered your life to God, then God has a plan for you. He has a plan. Now, that plan may not meet with your expectations, because that's certainly what happened to, uh, to Bill. I mean, okay, go help drunks. Well, aren't they magically getting well? No. No, they're not. Uh, but you're doing the deed, and as a result of doing the deed, you are staying sober, and you are planting seeds, too. A number of the people that Bill worked with and called failures later came back. I was a failure. Uh, first time I was uh, introduced to recovery. It did not take. But I tell you this, when the pain got worse, I knew where to go. I knew the people who had uh, tried to reach out to me, who had gone down further than I had gone down at that point. And I knew that they had found a way out. So, um, and then that I think leads us to the, the second um, lesson. And that's the gift of desperation. Uh, there is something uh, about the newcomer, uh, Tom Powers, who was um, sponsored by Bill Wilson, he said, he said, when a newcomer comes into the room, we should sit at his feet, <laughs> you know, not, not, not to build up his ego, <clears throat> but that we have something to learn from that guy. And what is it? It's the, it's the freshness of the pain that when someone walks in the room and they're sitting there terrified and they're in tears and they want to run. They have something to teach us. What is it? It's the gift of desperation. And, and, and I had that gift of desperation. And, and the thing that you got to learn about the gift of desperation is it doesn't last. It doesn't last. Uh, it, 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 <clears throat> neither does the spiritual transformation, the white light. It doesn't last. But it never goes away. There is, a, there is remembrance of it. And this is one of the reasons that we need to be working with, uh, with new people. Because we need to be reminded of what it was like. And they know. And we're forgetting. We're forgetting. So um, to me, that, that would be an, an important second lesson. And the third <clears throat> is that um, ultimately... Recovery is a gift, and it needs to be treated that way. That, um, that, that, that while I may have done some things to get ready for it, ultimately, it was a gift. And, and so I, I need, and this is, this is why the, being grateful and focusing on, on, on gr gratefulness is 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 so important uh, to us in recovery 
that uh, it came to me. Why did it come to me? I don't know. I mean, just about every member of my family uh, died of alcoholism. Uh, my sister uh, buried her not too long ago. Alcoholism. It's it's why why was I open to the gift, to the experience uh, of of change that others in my family were not, and and so many others that I've worked with uh, have not been. Um, I don't know the answer, uh, but I know it wasn't me, uh, and I know I know ultimately it was a gift. Um, so um, that gift is is through your story is really what you have to give to others, and 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 don't sell it short. If you will take your story and and see through your two-way prayer where it is that God is guiding you in your life, to whom, on a daily basis, is there someone I should call? Is there someone I should visit? Is there a meeting I should go to? You will receive guidance. If you, That was the belief of the Oxford Group people. And this was the thing I took away from the studies that was so important to me. Their belief that if you are trying to work the absolutes in your life, honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love, the things that Wilson said he put into steps six and seven, if you're trying to work these as a way of life, God will guide you. And so each morning we get up and we, and we write down in our journals uh, whatever guidance God may give us for that day. Um, we, don't, we don't know the purpose of it. We don't have to know. But we do have to be obedient if it meets the terms. Is it honest? Is it pure? Is it unselfish? Is it loving? Uh, to go and do that. And, and like the big book says, you know, the age of miracles um, is clear through, through the coming together of Bill and Bob. Uh, but it's just as clear in, in, in the lives of every alcoholic who has been transformed because uh, w this is a disease that ought to kill us. And um, when it doesn't, some special obligations come along with that. So I uh, hope this story, has, some of these stories have, have been helpful for you. Uh, I want you to um, <laughs> I really want you to do the two-way prayer because I think that's where God is waiting to, uh, to talk to you in a very different way. Uh, so give it a try. Do it for 30 days. See what happens. Uh, come to one of the workshops. Drop me a line, twowayprayer@gmail.com. Happy to send you an invitation. So thank you for listening. I hope it was helpful. Uh, God bless and keep coming back.